It's a whirlwind just like the storm that brought ruin to Job and destroyed his family. But in this whirlwind, God brings not ruin, but revelation. Not tragedy, but disclosure. But maybe the only thing more exciting than what God says is how God says it. God asks Job questions. Seventy questions, if my figuring is right. And in those 70 questions, he's basically asking Job, Job, how deep is your understanding? How much do you know about the way in which I ordered the universe? If you'll notice in this book, there are no answers. There are only questions. And then God selects from nature and gives Job an open book test about what he knows. In chapter 38, verse 12, God asks, Have you ever commanded the morning? No, I've appreciated it, but I've never commanded it. Job, just how intelligent are you? And then in verse 16, God says, Have you ever entered into the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? I'm afraid of the water. Have the gates of death been revealed to you? No, because if they had... I wouldn't be here to talk about it. Or have you ever seen the gates of deep darkness? How much do you know, Job? And later God asks, Has the rain drop a father? Or who has created the drops of dew? From whose womb did the ice come forth? And who has given us the frost from heaven? God is saying, you know, you need to think about it, Job. You're accusing me of being uncaring and unsympathetic, but I have to tell you, I have made a world to the depths of which you will never understand. It is running in perfect order and in flawless symmetry, and that's how much I love you. So then God turns to animals and begins in chapter 39 saying, Job, Job, do you know the time the mountain goat gives birth? Have you ever observed a deer calving? And then my favorite from the message, chapter 39, verse 19, beginning about the horse. Job, are you the one who gave the horse his prowess and adorned him with a shimmering mane? Did you create him to prance proudly and strike terror with his royal snorts? He paws the ground fearlessly, eager and spirited, and then charges into the fray. He laughs at danger, fearless, doesn't shy away from the sword. The banging and clanging of quiver and lance don't faze him. He quivers with excitement, and at the trumpet blast, races off at a gallop. At the sound of the trumpet, he neighs mightily, smelling the excitement of battle from a long way off, catching the rolling thunder of the war cries. And then he goes on to say about the hawk, do you understand how a hawk soars? Is it at your command that the eagle makes his nest on high? I have to tell you when I'm at this point in the book, I understand Job. I understand Job's accusations. Because I too have been in pain. I have been in physical pain, but I'll trade you that any day for the greatest pain of my past, and that is the suffering of emotional pain. I, like Job, I have been there. I have been there when the darkness was darkest. What God is saying to Job by raising all of these questions is that I'm a God of infinite care and love, and if I have everything working order, could it be just reasonable that you're accusing me of something that's incorrect? So then, God's second speech begins in chapter 4, verse 6, beginning. God again speaks out of the storm. And here, through chapter 41, God answers the second accusation about control. Short version, Job has said to God, at best you're inept, and at worst you're incompetent. You have no real power to rule the universe. But again, to answer this charge, God speaks about Animals, two in particular, are associated with 
life in the waters. And what you have to remember is that the sea, to the ancients, is a symbol of chaos. And these big animals are to be considered as some kind of super symbols of the chaos of life. God is saying that if I control these animals, then the world is not chaotic. And the first creature is portrayed as behemoth. Behemoth. Most scholars would say this is a hippopotamus. The hippopotamus is known to inhabit all of Egypt and Africa. And today they come no farther than the second and third cataracts of the Nile River. But in ancient times, they lived in lower Egypt. Another possible interpretation of behemoth. A buffalo, a water buffalo. For in the Palestine of the second millennium B.C., buffaloes were known to have roamed around the Lake Hula region just north of the Sea of Galilee. And there's some evidence that they were even grazing in the Jordan River Valley. So with these two possible explanations, may I again read to you from the message, chapter 40, beginning in verse 15. I think Eugene... Eugene Peterson has captured it well. Job is being talked to by God. God says, look at the land beast, behemoth. I created him as well as you. Grazing on grass, docile as a cow. Just look at the strength of his back, the powerful muscles of his belly. His tail sway, sways like a cedar in the wind. His huge legs are like beech trees. His skeleton is made of steel. Every bone in his body hard as steel. Most magnificent of all creatures, but I still lead him around like a lamb. The grass-covered hills serve him meals, while field mice frolic in his shadow. He takes afternoon naps under shade trees, cools himself in the reedy swamps, lazily cool in the leafy shadows as the breeze moves through the willows. And when the river rages, he doesn't budge, solid and unperturbed, even when the Jordan goes wild. But Job, you'd never want him for a pet. You'd never be able to housebreak him. God is saying, if I control them, it, then all of it is within my clutches. And therefore, evil, evil is not just random. Then things don't just happen by mistake. And then to make the metaphor even stronger, in chapter 41, he calls another animal Leviathan. Leviathan, most commentators are willing to say, is the crocodile. God says of the crocodile, can you draw Leviathan out with a fish hook? You know, never you mind some of those channels uh, that now show them doing that because they have more than fish hooks. They use guns and winches. Do you, are you able, Job, to just pull him out with a fly rod into your creel? No one is so fierce that you just go up and arouse a crocodile. And on that television channel, they try never to do that. Who are you to stand before me, Job? And then Job replies to God in chapter 40, verse 3. He said, God, behold, I'm, I'm insignificant. I mean, how can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. You do control nature and you do control the animal's if you provide for them, those simple creatures, how much more must you be caring for me? I think clearly Job is humiliated. Job has regrets. Job is going to retract what he has said to God, so he repents in dust and ashes. And Job is saying, I am sorry that I ever said you don't care, because I now know you care. And I'm sorry for saying that things are out of control, because I know now they are in control. That's what Job does. He retracts and repents. But that's something's not to be missed. It's what God didn't do. God did not provide Job answers. God gave Job not one answer, but simply kind of overwhelms, kind of steamrolls Job by the revelation of his ways and his creation. I felt a little of what Job once felt. It was when my wife 
a number of years, returned from a doctor's appointment to say what were to me horrifying words. In my checkup today, the doctors discovered a lump. I struggled with that more than she knows. I struggled mostly in the quiet of the night. And after I would put Nancy to bed, I would ask myself, how am I ever going to raise three children, these three children? I have to raise them alone. For quite some time, I thought about that. Now, I'd try to be brave in the daytime. That's what guys do. But just the same, I struggled. Many evenings, I would act like I was going to bed, and after she was asleep, I would tiptoe down to the living room. And there were times I wouldn't even turn the light on. And in the darkness of a lot of those quiet moments, I discovered the story of Job. But the greatest comfort that can be given to a person, and that's this. Comfort is not knowledge that everything's going to be all right. It's not knowledge that everything is going to be all right, but a knowledge that everything is under God's control. It's a knowledge that we have a God who is infinite in His mercies and in His caring. He is kind. Now what comforted me in that near tragedy and all others that I have since faced have not been answers because frankly, there are none. Rather, comfort comes in knowing the character of God. I realize that God cares for me. He cares for goats. He cares for deer. He cares for the hawk. He cares for Kurt. And then undoubtedly, the world is not chaotic. God controls behemoth. He controls Leviathan. God controls all of the chaos. God is a, an infinite God, and I am a finite me. So, I could eventually turn out the lights go to bed, and rest not in my knowledge, but in confidence in the very character of God. And so allow me to ask this morning, you knew I would, when in the face of coming tragedies, and they will come, in the face of coming tragedies, what will be the source of your comfort? I suggest it's not knowledge but in the very character of God, a reliance on the revealed character of God. So maybe the Christian hymn writer had it right. When the darkness veils His lovely face, I rest on His unchanging grace. And when all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay.